Good evening. Thank you for inviting me to speak. I thought it would be helpful to start out to talk about where Middletown, New Jersey is and specifically where New Monmouth is. And so I have a map here showing the Northeastern United States. We have Delaware and Maryland down here. Pennsylvania is to the West. New York State is to the North. And we have Connecticut, Rhode Island and Massachusetts. If we zoom in, a little bit. The area that Middletown, New Jersey is located in uh, is approximately here. And as we zoom in, you can see Middletown. And New Monmouth is a, a village within Middletown. So as we get closer, you'll see uh, New Monmouth, a lovely suburban community. If we are fortunate in today's presentation, at some moment in the presentation, uh, we'll be going back in time. And so it's not the new Monmouth that you see here on the screen of 2022, but rather the mid 19th century village that preceded it, which was called Champsville. So this is uh, the factual basis of Henry Morford's nonfiction presentation in his memoirs. I'm going to switch to PowerPoint and begin the presentation. So Dr. Blair, uh, yeah. oh, there you go, perfect. Okay, so my, my title is Hello from Bushy Hollow, Henry Morford's New Monmouth, Middletown, New Jersey, circa 1838-1843. I have two epigraphs. One is from a recent movie, the, uh, a, a sequel to a sequel to a sequel of The Matrix. The character Morpheus says the line, our memories turned into fiction any less real. Um, as you'll see in this presentation, the idea of uh, reality and memories and fiction uh, all play an important role in what Henry Morford was doing. Uh, the second epigraph is from Henry Charlton Beck. Uh, Thus I, always, I hope always to see in what there is at least a wavering shadow of what there used to be. If I were to situate my interests relative to Beck's wonderful body of work, I would say that Beck is interested in forgotten towns and I am interested in forgotten books. So let's begin. You might not even see it if you didn't go looking for it. In Middletown Township's New Monmouth neighborhood, heading eastbound on Cherry Tree Farm Road, east of Harmony Road, a small creek runs beneath the roadway. On the north side of Cherry Tree Farm Road, the creek runs through a culvert pipe buried below suburbia. But on the south side of the road, the creek emerges into the open in the shadow of smallish trees and heavy undergrowth that line its banks. From the roadway at driving speed, the only indication of the creek is a short length of guardrail. Above that stand a speed limit sign and a telephone pole. 
A few yards further east is a blue sign for the local library with an arrow pointing straight ahead. The library sign and arrow are ironic because they point towards a place and also towards how to find it. The place is Bushy Hollow, but no street sign or historical marker indicates its location. To find Bushy Hollow nowadays, one must search in time, for Bushy Hollow occupied the same location as present day New Monmouth, but about 180 years ago, when it was nationally known. Since then, farmers and, uh, farms and bulldozers have come and gone and contem contemporary suburbia has sprouted. Yet despite many changes, Bushy Hollow has been perfectly preserved, not in the sense of a historic site one can walk through, but as if in a time capsule, in some sketches, in a for forgotten old book by the most literary member of a founding family of Monmouth County. Anyone who wants to find Bushy Hollow can do so. Just follow the arrow to your local library or your home computer. Finding the book. The creator of Bushy Hollow is Henry Morford, who was born in what's now New Monmouth back in 1823, almost 200 years ago. A substantial body of genealogical research about the Morford family shows its establishment in Monmouth County in the 17th century and its generational spread across the United States to Delaware and Pennsylvania, west to Indiana and Kentucky, and eventually to Iowa, where there is a Morfordsville and beyond. However, the narrowness of my theme confines me to the branch of the family that stayed in New Jersey, and specifically in Monmouth County, and about five or six generations up the family tree. As a writer, Henry Morford was remarkably prolific. He wrote for at least a half dozen periodicals, two of them a newspaper and a magazine he owned. He also wrote seven novels, at least six plays, three collections of short poetry, and several longer poems. He published a sequel to a long poem by Lord Byron and a sequel to a novel by Charles Dickens. He also wrote seven books of travel literature, guiding Americans through New York City and through Brooklyn, across the country to California, across the border to Canada, and across the Atlantic to Scotland, England, Paris, and other places in Europe. When he died in 1881, he was perhaps best known for that travel literature. However, also among his best-selling works were three novels that he wrote during and about the American Civil War. Shoulder Straps, The Days of Shoddy, and The Coward, published in only 13 months, July 1863 to July 1864. However, six months before these three war novels, Morford published another wartime book of humorous nonfiction, Sprees and Splashes, or Droll Recollections of Town and Country. Sprees and Splashes merits our attention for several reasons. First, in the context of Morford's concurrently published three Civil War novels, Sprees is entertainment for the home front, a reminder of happier times, and was marketed as such. In the context of his post-Civil War travel writing, Sprees attempts to entertain travelers, an audience that he cultivated for the last 15 years of his life. The book's extended subtitle indicates that it is a book for railroad rides and half hours. Third, because Spreeze was intentionally droll or humorous, it is part of the emergence of American literary humor in the 1860s, which culminated in figures like Mark Twain. Fourth, Spreeze is self-consciously experimental, manipulating the boundary between fact and fiction. The preface to Sprees begins, in one respect, this collection of sketches is believed to be different from any previous product of the American press. All of the incidents being related, being personal to the writer or within his knowledge to intimate acquaintances. No other excuse can be given for the too frequent use of the pronoun I in the volume. Here Morford distinguishes apologetically between self-indulgent egotism and accurate memoir. 
To make the book acceptable to the public, Morford says in his preface, he takes two steps. One is to clean up the language of people in the book who are from the rougher and less careful classes of society, whose works were not always picked and measured. Here, his goal is to use as few rough expressions as possible without sacrificing naturalness. In other words, the book contains literary representations of lower class people and keeps their speech natural, but inoffensive. A second step Morford takes is to disguise the identities of some of the people who appear in the book. Where well-known persons have been introduced, a thin veil has been drawn over their personality by slight changes of name, while the sound is generally near enough to enable friends to trace out the reality. If one takes Morford at his word that the sketches of sprees and splashes are based on real people and real events, there is yet a fifth possibility for reading the book. The sketches function as memoirs that recollect local history. All five avenues merit exploration, but this fifth and last, memoir recollecting local history, is the one we will follow and see where it leads. Finding Bushy Hollow. Finding Bushy Hollow in time is surprisingly easy if one does a little chronological arithmetic with information the book provides. According to the preface, Sprees and Splashes was published in January 1863. In the book, three sketches, numbers 2, 17, and 21, all begin with a rhetorical formula of sorts, explicitly mentioning Bushy Hollow and stating that the first person narrator, or Mor Morford, was living there 20 to 25 years earlier. Subtracting that time span from the publication date, Bushy Hollow flourished within a five-year range of 1838 to 1843, give or take a year either way, because the book's publication month was January. Situating Bushy Hollow in space involves historical geography relative to Morford's early life. Most sources say that Morford was born and raised in New Monmouth, which is somewhat imprecise. In 1823, when he was born there, New Monmouth was not yet New Monmouth. It was called Chanceville. From when it was founded, around 1815, up until the 1850s. According to the charming Thomas Leonard, Chanceville, now New Monmouth, was named for a Mr. Chance, a former resident. Chanceville as a local place name or toponym is still commemorated in New Monmouth today by a street name, Chanceville Place, and a township recreation area, Chanceville Park. So New Monmouth used to be Chanceville, and the remarks that follow suggest that Chanceville is Bushy Hollow. One may imagine Bushy Hollow with the help of cartography and some contemporaneous maps. One factor to consider is property ownership. The areas of Chanceville that were owned by Henry Morford's father and extended family. Here, one may rightly hesitate. Morford's Bushy Hollow dates from 1838 to 1843, an approximate five-year window. This earliest detailed property map of Chanceville appears to be the 1851 Lightfoot map, which is seven or eight years later. While more detailed historical property research might shed some additional light, the 1851 Lightfoot map provides the basic details of Henry Morford's extended family and the land they owned in Chanceville around the time that Morford was coming of age. Speaking of Middletown Township, the 1922 history of Monmouth County says that the land in the western part of the township, north of Middletown Village, on which New Monmouth, formerly Chanceville, is situated, was formerly owned by the Morford family. Of these, Henry Morford's paternal grandfather, William, divided his vast tract of land among his four sons. Middletown historian Randall Gabrieland refers to several Morford farms, including one near Swartzel Road. This is confirmed by the 1851 Lightfoot map, which shows a remor remarkable arc of four consecutive farms extending from the west of Chanceville to the south of the center of Chanceville several hundred acres. In present terms, 
This is practically the whole area extending south of what is now Cherry Tree Farm Road between east of Harmony Road and east of Tyndall Road. From west to east, the map labels the four Marford farms, uh, E. Morford, W. Morford, T. Morford, and C. Morford. From Henry Morford's perspective, these would have been his paternal grandfather, William Morford's, and paternal grandmother, Lydia Stout Morford's, four sons, Henry's uncle, Elias, Henry's father, William, and Henry's uncles, Thomas and Charles. Elias and William had farms on the south side of Cherry Tree Farm Road. Thomas's was on what is now New Monmouth Road, and Charles had two farms near what's now Tyndall and Swartzel Roads. As a teenager and young man, Henry would have had ready access to all of them. So besides Chanceville, another way to define Bushy Hollow geographically is that it was the area in and around the four Morford Brothers farms, which collectively formed most of the Southwestern quadrant from the center of what's now New Monmouth. Lightfoot's 1851 map tells us about the location of the Morford Brothers lands in Chanceville but not how the Morfords used those lands. To use that requires another map, Hassler's 1845 map of New York Bay, dated 3 June 1844, may provide another helpful perspective on what Chanceville of the Bushy Hollow period looked like. Unlike the 1851 Lightfoot map, Hassler's 1845 map does not label individual property owners but it does suggest actual land use. On Hassler's map, clustered around the center of Chanceville are about 20 buildings. Beyond that, some cultivated areas are along the south of what is now called Cherry Tree Farm Road and on both sides of New Monmouth Road. However, south and west of those roads and elsewhere, large areas around Chanceville are shown as wooded including much of the Morford brothers' lands, especially his father William's farm west of the village. Henry Morford's adjective bushy seems apt. The Hassler map is actually surprising in the amount of Morford brothers' lands that were still wooded in 1845. Then again, there was a sawmill across the road from William Morford's farm, and he and other Morford brothers owned and operated a lumber yard in the center of Chancebelt and many, perhaps most buildings back then, needed firewood. So in 1845, the Chanceville area was more heavily wooded and was harvested for lumber and firewood, much more so than in New Monmouth today. Bushy Hollow may be understood in a third way in terms of topography. Morford calls Bushy Hollow a hollow, which the Oxford English Dictionary says is a depression on the Earth's surface a place or tract below the general level, surrounded by heights, a valley or a basin. This topographical characterization seems also to apply to Chanceville. The 1845 map shows higher ground to the south and east. The 1851 Lightfoot map shows four water courses that cross the Morfords farms. Though flowing water changes course and hydrological designations change name, all four, four water courses still exist in different form or name today. Starting from the west, the first of these was and still is Pews Creek, which was our starting point where the library sign is, right about there, the, I, the dot on the I where Collins is. As the 1851 map shows in Morford's day, Pews Creek extended south of what is now Cherry Tree Farm Road and west of what is now called Morford Road, which was once the driveway to Henry, Henry's uncle Elias's house. Much of what the 1851 Lightfoot map shows as the southern streak of Pews Creek is now intermittent, runs underground or between backyards. Moving eastward, what was then called Compton's Creek split into three branches that crossed the Morfords lands. The westernmost of the three was in 1851, a 
the western branch of Compton's Creek, but is now called Mill Brook. At what's now Cherry Tree Farm Road, the 1851 map notes S. Mill, a sawmill. The central branch of Compton's Creek in 1851, which flowed just east of the center of Chanceville, is now the western branch of Town Brook, which branches, branches off of Town Brook near Leonardville Road and runs behind New Monmouth Elementary School. Finally, the easternmost water course right here, was in 1851 the main Compton's Creek, but is now called Town Brook. All four watercourses originate in higher terrain in the south and wind their way northward towards the Bay Shore. In the 19th century, each had its own small valley, since then likely backfilled to control flooding. Any one of these watercourses, or all four of them collectively, might be the hollow after which Bushy Hollow is named. By 1851, most of the land south of Cherry Tree Farm Road between Pews Creek, that library sign, and Town Brook was owned by the four Morford brothers, so that the area between and around these watercourses could also be understood as Bushy Hollow. Contemporaneous depictions of property ownership, land use, and bodies of water all help to shed light on the location and nature of Bushy Hollow. Finding Henry, the narrator. Henry Morford was born in Chanceville on March 10th, 1823. With him dating the Bushy Hollow sketches 20 to 25 years earlier than January, 1863, those sketches recount his memories when he was coming of age roughly between ages 15 and 20, again, give or take a year or two either way. Like any memoirist, he writes not about what actually occurred when he came of age, so much as what he remembers of that earlier time, looking back at it from about the age of 40. What actually occurred in his life at the time and what he remembered of it decades later may differ. Multiple sources say that he started working in his father and uncle's store around 1840, and at that time was appointed Chanceville's first postmaster. Two other kinds of biographical information around 1838-1843, independent of Sprees, may provide context for his later Bushy Hollow memoir essay. Around the same year as his half-sister Margaret was born, 1840, when he was about 17 years old, he began writing poetry, fairly confidently imitating the popular British romantic poetry of that time. When he thought the poems were finished, he copied them into a sketchbook, now in the possession of the Monmouth County Historical Associated, Association and dated to around 1840. The booklet title page boldly announces poems, etc below which there is a watercolor of a Native American in a canoe on a body of water surrounded by wooded hills. A later handwritten note refers the reader to The Indian, see page 13, on which a poem entitled The Indian begins. A second title page of the sketchbook says, My Scrapbook, with flourishes below. There is no table of contents, but what follows is about 50 pages of handwritten poems apparently copied into the book at different times with page numbers added later. The poems often begin or end with a hand-drawn eye break, either to separate poems ending and beginning on the same page or to fill up unused space at the bottoms of pages. Distinctive handwritten fonts, often bold, are used for the poem titles. Similar features can be found in another Henry Morford scrapbook now owned by Harvard University and dating from the same time. In 1840, Morford also published his first book locally, a seven page long poem entitled The Music of the Spheres. By 1842, 1843, he was publishing poems in magazines. So during the time period Morford describes in the Bushy Hollow sketches, he was already actively engaged in creative writing. Beyond all the 1839 to 1843 poems though, 
he had a different creative writing project in mind. A second source of information about Henry Morford at that time are some letters he sent to a friend, Therese Walling, mainly in the 1840s, in the Vera Conover collection, also preserved by the Monmouth County Historical Association. In a November 5th, 1845 letter to Walling, Morford confides that he has a new writing project in mind. By the way, if you are not too indignant to entertain the correspondence, I shall one of these days or nights set down to prove to you in earnest that egotism, even so called, is not only one of the most common qualities of mind, but also one of the most necessary and still more one of the most delightful for which labor I have in my storehouse, not all, a collection of trifles, not unworthy of an antiquarian, which I mean to publish. Here in this lengthy sentence may be the seed of what 18 years later became sprees and splashes. 22 year old Henry Morford imagines a published collection of stories based on his memories. His metaphor for his own head, a storehouse, is reminiscent of Augustine's memory palace in his confessions, as well as the Morford brothers' more homey general store in Chanceville at which Henry had been working. He intends to write trifles, not a sustained effort like a novel, but shorter and lighter pieces. He intends to write not egotistically to indulge himself, but rather to write out of necessity about his own experiences and observations because he knows them best. And so he anticipates his later Spree's 1863 prefaces concern about the quote unquote, too frequent use of the pronoun I in the volume. Sometime after this 1845 letter to Walling, Morford began writing the sketches. The earliest one I have located so far appeared in 1852 on the front page of the second number of his Keyport-based newspaper, the New Jersey Standard, shortly after he bought it under the series title, Sketches of a Country Shopkeeper. The sketch is entitled The Pensioners and Morford later revised and incorporated it into the fifth chapter of his Civil War novel, The Coward. Since this newspaper sketch is numbered number two in the series and appears in the second issue of the newspaper, this means that Morford started publishing his sketches as soon as he started publishing his newspaper. By 1855, the series title had changed to Droll Recollections, and he published under a pseudonym, Robert of Burley. The fictionalized version of Chanceville he called Bushy Hollow seems to have premiered in September 1855 in a sketch entitled, Oh, Old Joe Bramby. In the 1863 book, Sprees and Splashes, four of the sketches may be said to be Bushy Hollow sketches. Three of these explicitly mention both the place Bushy Hollow and the time of 20 to 25 years earlier. Old Joe Brandy, Sam Brown's Mush, and two big shots at Waterfowl. A fourth sketch, My Last Sunday on Skates, does not explicitly mention Bushy Hollow, but does repeatedly mention the same time frame. Morford may have published other Bushy Hollow sketches in newspapers, but excluded them from sprees and splashes. However, the above four sketches reflect Morford's intention to provide a national audience with information about what Bushy Hollow was like. A visit to Bushy Hollow. If one were to walk into the village of Bushy Hollow, starting from where that same library sign is now, what might one experience? The first things might be the homes on the village's outskirts and the aromas coming from their kitchens. On the outskirts of Bushy Hollow, residents have homes with cleared plots of land around them. The Bushy Hollow home described in most detail is that of old Joe Bam Bramby, who lives in a little cabin on a half acre clearing in the Jersey backwoods built of pine clapboards, uh, unsealed and miserably furnished. 
another resident, Sam Brown, has a few acres of pasture ground with a couple of cows and some pigs and a home with a central room that serves as both kitchen and shoemaking workshop. workshop. Space and fuel were both objects of no small consequence to persons in Sam's pecuniary circumstances. And the benches for himself and the boys in winter were consequently arranged along the wall in the kitchen. And the same fire that warmed them did the cooking for the family. As for the aromas of cooking food, a staple dish in Bushy Hollow was mush, boiled cornmeal, similar to what we might call polenta. The 17th sketch, Sam Brown's Mush, begins with two paragraphs that variously list the other names by which, by which mush was then called and mush's widespread popularity, concluding that mush with real milk accompaniment is so popular that it may almost be called a national dish. In Bushy Hollow, some families eat mush three times a day, prepared differently for each meal. In those days, in the section of country where Sam lived, and in families no more wealthy than his, it was customary to boil a pot of mush almost every day, have it smoking hot for supper, cold for breakfast the next morning, and perhaps a part of it sliced and fried as a substitute for hot bread at dinner. How to prepare mush? Henry Morford provides something of a recipe. The big iron pot was hanging over the fire in that room with water set to boil and to be thickened with cornmeal for mush whenever it should reach the boiling point. Artists in mush manufacture know that the water requires to boil just enough and not too much before it can be thickened to advantage and that the thickening must be done with a dainty hand and the proper quantity of stirring for each thimble full of meal that falls into the water in order to prevent such a calamity as it's being lumpy. To this mixture, add salt to taste. In the skin sketch, the mush is simmered on low heat for the entire afternoon. It's then served. The mush was smoking hot in a large dish in the center of the table and bowls with milk were arranged round the sides of the table with a big earthen cup of molasses for such as might prefer the preparation with that sauce. The mush is ladled out with a big pewter spoon that stood in the middle of the smoking preparation, which indicates the mush's thick consistency. It sounds pretty tasty, actually. Now, I won't spoil the mush or the sketch too much, other than to say that this sketch is of the too many cooks variety and the outcome is so extreme that in the sketch's final punchline, after the inedible mush is fed to the family's pigs, the result is salt pork. Besides mush, milk was sometimes served with the mush or was a basis for other meals. Sam Brown has cows, the milk of which was, of course, the leading dependence in the way of food for the family, cooked and served up in nearly every way known to rude cookery. The milk was frequently used in the preparation of what Morford calls spoon vittle, sometimes called spoon meat, preparations like porridge and gruel, in which grains like oat or oats are added to milk, and simmered until reduced and thickened. Mush and milk were supplemented by meat, not necessarily the kind sold by a butcher, but rather the local wildlife, which was free. This is the topic of Spree's 21st sketch, Two Big Shots at Wildfowl, which begins, there were, in the time of my sojourn in the classic neighborhood of Bushy Hollow 20 years ago, any quantity of sporting characters thereabouts. And all, almost every man kept his gun in his house ready loaded for game. Every mechanic too kept a loaded gun in his shop, ready for a chance shot at wild fowl, bird, squirrel, or rabbit. Old Joe Bramby's list of game is similar but more detailed. While Bramby technically does not admit to hunting for a reason to be mentioned below, he claims that he accidentally killed 
a variety of what he calls game, including a squirrel, blue jays, robins, six rabbits, quail, and partridges. Enough so that he says it took him a week to collect them all. Curiously, in the two lists of local game, there appear to be no deer in Bushy Hollow, no larger game of any kind at all. At least none are mentioned. Beyond seeing the homes on the outskirts of Bushy Hollow and smelling food being cooked, if the weather were good, one might start to see the local residents and specifically at a distance, how they are dressed. As might be expected around the mid 19th century, Bushy Hollow families tend to include two parents and several children. For example, old Joe Brandy's family consists of himself, his wife, and half a dozen children. Another resident, Sam Brown, is similarly described as having a pretty numerous family, which includes himself, his wife, Polly, and four daughters. This sketch also refers to Sam Brown's boys, but it is unclear whether these are apprentices, sons, or both. In another Bushy Hollow sketch set outdoors in the winter, a local mill proprietor, Jake Geralaman, accompanies at least three daughters. As for how all these residents are dressed, old Joe Brandy's wife wears, quote, a frock of inevitable blue calico. The adjective inevitable is curious and suggests that blue calico was common in Bushy Hollow, possibly a fabric Morford himself sold in his family's Chanceville store. Joe wears coarse homespun or clothing and cloth made by his wife, probably wool, in the wintertime. In the summer, he wears cheap cotton drilling, what we might call khakis. Joe also has a tarpaulin hat made of stiff, rainproof fabric, which Morford speculates Joe may have gotten from a family member. Joe's boots were always patched until thrown away. His children are also poorly clothed. Morford describes them as slattern or dirty, and as equally bareheaded and barefooted. Some Bushy Hollow residents are dressed better than Joe's family, for there is a hatter in the village. Moving from the outskirts of the village, more towards its center, within a quarter mile of the village, there is a sawmill owned by a man named Wilson, whose home is a quarter mile away from the sawmill in another direction. This may be the same sawmill mentioned in another Bushy Hollow sketch, My Last Sunday on Skates, a mill which has planks extending out over the ice and logs that formed a border around it. In turn, this may be the S mill noted on the 1851 Lightfoot map. The village of Bushy Hollow itself has a small commercial center. There is at least one shopkeeper and possibly two. There's also a laboring man whose work is done near the aforementioned Hatters, and there's the home of a decoy maker. Two other residents work at home or in multiple locations. Morford describes Sam Brown's work, shoemaking, at some length, because by the book's publication date of 1863, the production model Brown followed earlier was becoming increasingly less common and was being replaced by factories and machines. I should say that Sam was a shoemaker living at Bushy Hollow, a kind of boss journeyman, if such phrase may be coined for the occasion, himself and two or three apprentices doing the work for manufacturers living in the country towns adjacent, as the practice is still followed in some portions of the Eastern states. Besides the absence of a commute, Morford adds that Sam working from home was advantageous because his wife and daughters tended the food and provided distractions. And Sam kept things lively at work by circulating a jug of whiskey. Another Bushy Hollow resident, old Joe Brandy, is a woodman, i.e. one of those poor men who made their daily living by felling trees and cutting them up in cordwood, toiling on lands not their own, living poorly, bearing hardly, but seeming to feel no trouble beyond an ax of bad temper or an occasional decline in the price per cord for chopping. Old Joe 
only owns only a half acre clearing around his house. And since a clearing is not wooded, he collects firewood from other people's land. The phrase toiling on lands not their own suggests more specifically the forested portions of the Morford family's lands. Later in this sketch, Burnett, a shopkeeper, dealt in every description of article known to trade, had several acres of woodland not far from his residence and had employed Bramby to chop a portion of his timber. What follows is a discussion between Burnett and Bramby as for why for a week Burnett hadn't been clearing the land. Now Bramby's explanation is a tall tale that the ax he was using shattered so violently that the metal shards killed all near, nearby wildlife, which he says he's been picking off the forest floor for the past week. More likely, instead of clearing Burnett's land, Bramby has been poaching from it to feed his family. While this tall tale is charming, Bramby tells it in a shop to a shopkeeper who owns forested land a description applicable also to Henry Morford's father, William, whose house is right here, it's this dot, and his uncle Charles. In the same sketch, the very next anecdote occurs also in a store when Stevenson, another country shopkeeper, was one night trying to sell Joe a pair of peg boots. Given the level of detail in the shop conversations, Perhaps Morford observed these incidents himself while he was working in his family's store or heard them from his father or uncle. Since Morford's preface says that he changes the names of some of the real people he depicts, Burnett or Stevenson might have been Morford's father or uncle. If so, then in real life, old Joe Brandy seems likely to have been someone who lived in Chanceville near the Morfords. The sketch's beginning notes that Bramby passed away around the sketch's time frame of 1838 to 1843. My attempts to find a local resident by the name of Bramby or variations on that name has so far been unsuccessful. However, an alternative possibility is suggested by a remark old Joe makes when he is away from home, staying overnight at Holton's, which is a considerable distance from his, Bramby's, residence. All of Holton's chimneys are smoky, and old Joe explains that he once had a smoky chimney, but fixed it. Old Joe says his house was in a place he calls Seaboard County, about which more in a moment, and specifically the house was out yonder in Wolf Hollow 10 or 12 years ago. Wolf Hollow and Bushy Hollow may or may not be the same place, but near the New Jersey coast in the early to mid 1800s, woods were wolves were rare to non-existent. One hastens to add that some other old New Jersey towns are supposedly named for uh, animals improbable or uncommon in New Jersey, such as red lion in Burlington County. Now, if there were no Jersey Shore wolves, then a place named after a wolf seems unlikely. In this case, the Wolf of Wolf Hollow may not be a place name, but a person's name. A short distance north of William Morford's farm, where Henry Morford may have grown up, the 1851 Lightfoot map shows a house labeled J. Wolf. You can see it towards the top of the screen. Now, this could just be a coincidence, but maybe a member of Chanceville's Wolf family. At the time, Henry Morford did know of a local Wolf family and its circumstances. In his newspaper, the New Jersey Standard, in the issue of November 23, 1853, Morford editorialized about the need for leniency for a local boy charged with larceny, one Johnson E. Wolf, on the grounds that the crime was encouraged by an older brother and that those who knew his circumstances are well certified that the payment of his fine is impossible. So at least by 1853, two years before the old Joe Brandy sketch first appeared in the same newspaper, Henry Morford knew of a poor local family named Wolf 
and mentions no father, circumstances consistent with the details of the Brambies provided in the sketch. In Bushy Hollow, during much of the year when the weather permitted, most residents of Bushy Hollow worked. However, the sketch, My Last Sunday on Skates, says that in the winter, ice skating was common. In the neighborhood upon the mill pond, Morford says, during all the weekdays, it was occupied by relays of boys who seemed to have grown into skates as naturally as they had come into their ragged trousers and without a particle of sympathy for the slides and tumbles of less versatile humanity. The skates used then were not the kind used now, but consisted of a blade with straps and buckles that attached to the underside of boots or shoes. Uh, the ones in the slide are uh, from that time period and are in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Suffice it to say that the sketch is about how Morford's skating experience was physically and psychologically unpleasant, so much so that he curses on the Sabbath and refers to the skates as the double serpent of the strap, runner, and buckle. That experience was all the more unpleasant because he was being observed skating by two potential girl girlfriends for two straight hours, during which, he says, he fell at a rate of twice a minute for two hours. Perhaps noteworthy, is that Henry Morford's Bushy Hollow does not present that he came from one of the oldest and most wealthy families in Monmouth County with multiple immediate family members owning many acres and having business interests in and around Chanceville. In contrast, Bushy Hollow's residents are all middle to lower class. While the sketches include some small business owners such as shopkeepers and a mill owner, they are background figures and none of them is the main focus of a sketch as are two poorer residents, old Joe Bramby and Sam Brown. Morford's work in the family store and as the village postmaster would have brought him in contact with a wide variety of local residents, almost all of whom were less well off than his family. Morford also suggests that when he was growing up, luxuries were not yet fashionable, not even in his own family. In sketch 17, Sam Brown's mush, Morford says that the time was some five and 20 years ago when primitive food and fashions were much more in vogue than they are at present. And the section very near, was very near the place of my own residence at that time where homely comforts were plenty enough, but luxuries almost entirely unknown. This description does slightly separate Morford's father's home, the place of my own residence at the time, from the section or Bushy Hollow. However, the passage refers to how at that time, both locations valued primitive food and fashions. The referent of where luxuries were almost unknown is grammatically ambiguous. It can refer to the subject of the clause, uh, where luxuries are almost entirely unknown is Bushy Hollow, or to the nearest now, the adjacent home where Morford grew up. To put this another way, the poorer residents are not well off, but don't know it because of prevailing social norms. Old Joe Bramby, for example, has a six wife, sick wife and six shoeless children who made up his domestic jewels, jewels that would scarcely have been riches to one differently born and nurtured, unquote. What one chooses to believe about Bushy Hollow being Chanceville depends on a number of factors, among them the extent to which one knows the area and its history, the degree of one's openness to confirmation bias, whether multiple possibilities make something more or less probable, and what threshold of evidence constitutes sufficient proof beyond a reasonable doubt were based on a preponderance of the evidence. Theme park depictions of the past preserved or recreated historical villages and buildings and dressing up as reenactors all continue to be popular. Many people want to imagine the past and even experience it. However imperfect and temporary, 
that experience must be at little expense and with little effort, a local author like Henry Morford enables local readers to experience a curious paradox, to see a place already right under one's nose, but to see it differently with new eyes, ironically, the eyes of the past. Conclusion. If the details of Henry Morford's life shed some light on Bushy Hollow as a depiction of remembered Chanceville, then this may be true of other locations mentioned in Sprees and Splashes as well. In this case, the present effort limited only to one small village in four sketches in one book, may be only a starting point for a broader geographical view. Perhaps a good example may be found in two other spree sketches. Sketch 16 entitled The 240 Funeral and sketch 19 entitled How Waddy Briggs Died and How Squire Horton Resurrected Him, both of which are set in a town called Edgewood. Morford says of Edgewood that it was a country village where I happened to be located a dozen or more of years ago. And Edgewood was also the little village honored by the residents of the writer. So again, Morford gives us a time period relative to the publication date of 1863 when he was living in what he calls Edgewood. A dozen or more years earlier than the book's publication in 1863, would be 1851 or earlier. The 1850 US census puts him, his wife Blanche, and their two daughters, Eva and Caroline, in Middletown Township on September 3rd, 1850. However, the National Archives postmaster records say that Henry's father, William, took over the Chanceville Post Office duties on April 10th, 1852. By this time in 1852, Henry appears to have been living on Front Street near the Standards main office in Keyport. So Edgewood may be Keyport. Similarly, the 11th sketch names a real place not too far from Keyport or Chanceville. Sketch 11 is entitled The Long Branch Murder. This sketch is set in 1860 in the early years of Long Branch's development as a resort. In order to attract tourists, a murder was faked. The New York Times covered the supposed murder on its front page. The exchange system among newspapers at that time ensured that the Times's story was circulated nationally with the result that Long Branch got free national publicity. Morford tells the story of the hoax, evidently from one of those involved with it, possibly a New York City police officer. Regrettably, I must save telling you this story for another time. Most intriguing though, is that in the old Joe Bramby sketch, as you may recall, old Joe says he once had the worst smoky chimney in all of Seaboard County. Old Joe's smoky chimney is a smoking gun of sorts, a clue towards a broader way to see beyond sprees and splashes to a more extensive understanding of Henry Morford's literary career and its relationship to where he grew up. Morford used the same county name in a different book. Seaboard County is the main setting of Morford's novel four years later in 1866, utterly wrecked a novel of American coast life. The novel refers to rough coasts, plural, not one coast singular, but two. Most of the action of that novel occurs on one of the coasts in and near a place called Topsail Beach, but some occurs inland in the local seat of government of the county, which is named Clayborough. The long muddy street of Clayborough, the local seat of government in Seaboard County, within which lay Topsail Beach and all its dependencies. A mile in length along the main street, pleasant in summer, but much gloomy and desolate in winter, was Clayborough. The novel's narrator goes on to describe the muddiness of the main street, the Clayborough, Clayborough Courthouse, 
and the Board of Chosen Freeholders. Assuming that Brandy never lived very far away from Bushy Hollow, and assuming that in two different works, Morford was referring to the same Seaboard County, then Seaboard County would be Monmouth County and Clayborough would be the county seat freehold. And Morford has yet another novel about the Battle of Monmouth Court Courthouse, explicitly set in and near freehold, The Spur of Monmouth, 1876. Morford's preface to that novel and the novel's narrator both explicitly discuss the found fuzzy boundary between fact and fiction. So to sum up, we have Morford's 1845 letter to Therese Walling about intending to publish what he had in his novel, a collection of trifles not unworthy of an uh, antiquarian. We have his 1852 to 1855 sketches, including the first Bushy Hollow sketches that he published in his newspaper, the New Jersey Standard. We have his 1863 nonfiction books, Freeze and Splashes, which mentions Seaboard County, the 1866 crossover of Seaboard County as the setting of his novel, Utterly Wrecked, and his 1876 novel, The Spur of Monmouth. All of this suggests that the Bushy Hollow sketches were part of a multi-book initiative that Henry Morford pursued intermittently for over three decades a semi-fictional personal representation of Monmouth County's history from the American Revolution into the mid 19th century. Within this scope, Bushy Hollow is only one village for about five years, but almost certainly not the only one. Edgewood and Clayborough also beckon. Morford's close connection to Monmouth County is perhaps best represented by his original plan to publish his third book of poems, Rhymes of 20 Years. Five years before that book's 1859 publication, and shortly before he started writing the Bushy Hollow sketches in 1854, he sought to create support to publish his poetry book on a subscription basis by leaving sign-up sheets in local businesses and by running an advertisement, a prospectus, in his newspaper, the New Jersey Standard. Although Morford's attempt to drum up local support for his poetry book was ultimately unsuccessful, Morford's advertisements proposed dedication will serve as a final word to the honest men and noble women of Monmouth County, New Jersey, <laughs> among whom the life of the author has been so far spent and these rhymes written, this book is respectfully dedicated. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was great. Thank you. And you can see me. Okay. Yeah, that was really interesting. First of all, how you put all those clues together to come up with the actual locations. I think that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I owe it all to Henry Morford. He's very descriptive. And uh, the fact that he says at the very beginning, I'm telling you things that actually happened. Yeah, uh, that that makes it easy. Yeah, it certainly does. Well, that's, that's why we love primary sources, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how he popularized the word shoddy. I mean, we all use that word. It's mm -hmm. so it's such like a, you know, it's across the well, I don't know about, you know, it's across this continent anyway. I don't know if they use it over in, in Europe, but yeah. Yeah, I think I think the word predates uh, Morford, uh, but uh, Morford's characterization of it, um, it, it ended up being popular. The Days of Shoddy was a bestseller. Mm -hmm. um, people enjoyed it because it, in some ways, it didn't talk about the war. It talked about how businesses were profiting from the war by turning out inferior goods and, uh, uh, and supplies. Right, okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Questions tonight? I know that we have some of Dr. Blair's students on here, right? Dana, would you like me to stop sharing? No, that's okay. We're okay. good. We're good. I don't like to play with technology unless I really have to. <laughs> okay. Um, so, but I think you will be receiving the um, 
you will be receiving any questions then. Yeah, so far, no questions. Well, that's good because that means you were very thorough. It was very detailed. That's really good. And, um, oh, hang on. I, we have a question. Are the three farms still present today? Well, there's actually four farms. So there's uh, 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 Henry Morford's grandfather, William, had four uh, sons, and each of the sons appears to have gotten at least one farm. So it was Elias, William, um, Thomas, and Charles. The uh, lone vestige of all of this that you could go to is just off of Cherry Tree Farm Road, and it's called Morford Road. Mm -hmm. Morford Road was the driveway to Elias's house. So Henry Morford, uh, thank goodness, is actually uh, uh, commemorated indirectly by the presence of Morford Road. Okay, um, and you mentioned what sounded like a map called Hassler? Yes. And he'd like to know if you could spell that. Uh, let's see. Uh, H-A-S-S-L-E-R. That's one go I'm back. not I, familiar with. It's primarily a nautical map that shows okay. the adjoining coastline with the idea being that if your boat runs aground, you have some idea of where you might be. Okay. H-A-S-S-L-E-R. Uh, okay. The map was compiled in 1844, it was approved by the government and published in 1845. Uh, so that's the one that has all the forests on it. If you were looking for uh, at least cartographic evidence of what Bushy Hollow looked like, that's closest historically to the time period. Okay. Uh, Maggie, would like to know how you got involved with this local topic. Uh, I have actually been teaching Monmouth County literary history at my university for the better part of 12 years at both undergraduate and graduate levels. Uh, I had the good fortune when I was a graduate student to study late 19th and early 20th century American literature. And after a sufficient amount of time had passed uh, while I was teaching in this region, it finally occurred to me that the national literary history was really being reflected in local communities and with local authors and sometimes with famous authors who came here and wrote. So uh, I'm inspired somewhat by, as I mentioned, Henry Charlton uh, uh, Beck, mm -hmm. who uh, wrote about forgotten towns. I, uh, in some ways, Chanceville is a, for, is a forgotten town. Um, so thank you. Um, so Jim has his hand raised. Jim, can you put your uh, question in the chat for me? Um, Kathy would like to know where the photos um, of Bramby and Brown, the Brown houses come from. Uh, the, uh, they are, of course, not the actual houses. I should mention that. Um, the uh, Old Joe Bramby house is actually a, a house, a clapboard uh, cabin at, uh, in Appomattox, Virginia. And uh, the other one is a stock photo. Okay. And did he originate the music of the spheres, that phrase? Uh, no, he did not. That kind of predates him. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, this was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Blair. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about Henry Morford. I have only one other thing to say, which is that if you are from Middletown, Henry's 200th birthday is coming up in March. And I, I think you should do something about it. Uh, Henry, <laughs> Morford, Henry Morford is behind uh, Philip Fresnel may be the most famous writer that Monmouth County produced. Yeah, Philip would definitely be the uh, number one, I would say. Oh, yes. County. Yeah. That's great. And you're going to be with us next March as well, right? I am. I hope to be speaking at that time. 
about a writer named Margaret Whittemer, who's a little bit uh, more recent than Henry Morford. Margaret Whittemer uh, was born and raised in North Asbury Park and um, fictionalized North Asbury Park and the adjoining section of Ocean Township, Wanamasa, in one of her early novels in 1915 entitled Why Not? So I want to talk uh, in March about the connection between the fictional landscape of the novel and the real landscape of that particular area of Monmouth County. Great. Well, we can't wait for that. All right, sir. Thank you very much. And I will see you in March. Okay. Thank you all very much, everyone. I appreciate your questions and your attention. Have a pleasant yeah. evening. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Yeah.